I wanted to touch on one of the big controversies nowadays with um, St. Bellarmine, which is the claim that he's just like Thomas Jefferson, you know, that um, I I think the origins of this generally was that Robert Filmer in England wrote Patriarchia partly as a response to Bellarmine, uh, because Bellarmine, from what I understand, was critical of absolute monarchy. And Filmer wanted to defend basically complete absolute monarchy. And Thomas Jefferson was not a fan of Filmer. And I don't think anyone except Filmer and a few Kings were actually fans of Filmer. Uh, right. But because he was critical of Filmer in a few notes, that therefore it must have been because he was agreeing with Bellarmine there. So wondering if you could get into what actually was St. Robert Bellarmine's political philosophy, and is it actually the same as the Founding Fathers? Right, and so this is a bit of an urban legend. I actually wrote two articles on this subject in uh, Catholic Family News uh, earlier. Actually, no, it was last year. Um, So to kind of lay it out, so there's like this false dichotomy. So, oh, Bellarmine was critical of absolute monarchy. Therefore, he had to be a Jeffersonian liberal. Uh, Yeah, no, that's not actually how it works. And when you get into Bellarmine's writings, it's clear he hates democracy. He's cynical about republicanism and he he supports monarchy, you know, but he doesn't support absolute monarchy. The only real question for Bellarmine, this is mostly taken up in De Laetitia's where he's addressing uh, certain Anabaptists that are trying to argue that that the government itself is evil by its very nature and that you can't have any government whatsoever and it's against scripture and whatnot. So Bellarmine is trying to justify that uh, government has a certain authority even by scripture. And, and here's the basis for it, right? the natural law basis for why we, in, in man's fallen condition, there needs to be some kind of government. And so he lays out that all government comes from God, ultimately. And so the God is the, the origin of all political authority. The question is how that's realized. And so he says that it's immediately realized through the through the people not the popular will per se but at least the tacit consent of the people so and that would be if you're born in a monarchy and you uh you know you pay you pay your taxes your feudal taxes or whatever it is you happen to do or you're, you're a subject of that king uh, but you know basically <laughs> being you know born there according to your aristotelian notions is your tacit consent to the system and so for Bellarmine, that's it. That satisfies the, the popular sovereignty. And there's nothing in that that's any different from St. Thomas, right? So there's, um, you know, there's a lot of jumps from that to getting to, uh, to Jefferson. And, and none of which have anything at all to do with Bellarmine. They're actually developed by Protestants, by the English Civil War, by uh, a lot of the, the political conditions in England that give genesis to the, a lot of the theories and the notions. So the whole, the whole thing starts with um, Galliard Hunt, who was a, uh, um, what was it? He was head of the manuscript division at the Library of Congress. So he wrote a, a, an essay called Cardinal Bellarmine of the Virginia Bill of Rights. And he tries to lay out, frankly, a lot of very absurd claims historically that have no foundation whatsoever, Um, that all these people in the 18th century reading Bellarmine, it's just asserted without any kind of evidence or claim. Jefferson never mentions it once. Uh, Madison has a brief reference to him at some point in terms of um, books that were attempted to be acquired. There's no evidence that Jefferson ever read Bellarmine. And even if he did, uh, he would have been horrified by much of what he read in Bellarmine, it would just put him away and gone back to his actual influences, generally Locke, right? Yeah. The, um, and, and others. So, you know, so the whole, the, yeah, I think you encapsulate right. So the whole, the, the idea is that uh, the Bellarmine Jefferson legend is that uh, Robert Filmer comes around. He hates everything at Bellarmine's written in favor of popular sovereignty because that's sparking you know, theories of the English Civil War, this whole popular sovereignty business. So he writes Patriarcha to condemn Suarez and, uh, and Bellarmine. Yeah. And so then, and then, of course, Jefferson has a copy in his study, and therefore he must have seen all these passages of Bellarmine inside, in a, you know, Patriarch and said, wow, look at these thinkers. There's no evidence that that ever happened. The only thing that could be proven is that Jefferson owned the book, as he owned very many books. Jefferson never makes uh, reference to Filmer. Filmer was not very well read in seventeen in the 1770s or the 1760s. Um, you know, he was scarcely read at all because of another man named Algernon Sidney. 
who a century earlier had uh, he was eventually killed, executed for his, his uh, alleged complicity in the Rye House plot against Charles II. But uh, but he was a hero in the colonies. And he, um, you know, it was considered a hero and his political philosophy really makes a lot of the development that you'd already seen with Theodore Beza and even Calvin uh, in, in a lot of respects between the kind of very common medieval notion that Bellarmine has likewise of the notion of popular sovereignty and moving that forward into a notion of popular will as being requisite requisite for the, the establishment of, of legitimate government. So all of that is kind of missed in this, this hodgepodge of legend and, and assertions that have absolutely no foundation in uh, like, like what, uh, what does Hunt say? It, um, I have to pull up the article, but you know, all these people at the College of William and Mary were, were reading Bellarmine. It's like, based on what? Based on the fact that in 1750, there is a copy of a repurposed work of Bellarmine's. But nobody was really reading him on the English side. It's, it's just rather legendary. And so Jefferson, again, where is his influences? And I showed in this article, I think, uh, definitively. His, in, his influences are Algernon Sidney and John Locke and, you know, others that were very popular within the Virginia elite, right? And the same thing for Madison as well. Um, you know, the, uh, and even if they did, you know, as soon as Jefferson got to a position like uh, heretical books must be burned, the church has the right to, you know, establish the state, you know, the, the church itself should be the religion of the state and has an obligation to enforce Catholicism in the state. Uh, that Jefferson would have recoiled in horror, you know, if you read things like that. So there's there's just no evidence because if you want to make the case, you've got to find evidence. You've got to you know find where Jefferson drops, you know, Bellarmine's name and says this guy influenced me, and he does things for people he strongly disagrees with. Like he he gives recommendations. Jefferson does of books that people should read to understand political philosophy better. Never once does he mention Bellarmine. Never once does he say, hey, read Robert Filmer's citations of Bellarmine, where you can, you know, learn what, what he writes because it agrees with us. It never happens. Instead, he recommends, again, you know, reading Locke un, un, uh, without reserve. He says, read Locke. Um, read Algernon Sidney, who almost everyone had read in those days, his, his treatises on government. And then uh, he even adds in, like, Montesquieu. You read Montesquieu, although I have to give you a caution, because some things Montesquieu says in the spirit of the laws, I find problematic. And so don't read this and don't read this. Um, why wouldn't he? Jefferson himself was largely a religious, um, not prop, you know, not, not properly atheistic, probably closer to agnostic, even though he was formerly a Unitarian. He uh, I guess those are the, today. Those are exactly the same thing. But uh, <laughs> in those days, not so much. But, you know, but he didn't care, like whether it was a Protestant minister that warned him that he's going to be damned, his soul's going to be damned. And, and Jefferson thanks him. He says, you know, I understand that you're acting from the motives of your religion. You know, he, he does not, he's not saddled by a Catholic bias or a fear, uh, an anti-Catholic bias or a fear of what people are going to think of him as it is. I mean, he lost the 1800 election because he had... Um, you know, he was well known for being a Unitarian. And so that he was, he was in, in largely a public atheist in most people's minds. And so Adams, who was more reliably a congregationalist and could at least be understood to be a confessing Christian, won the election. And so and Jefferson really didn't care. I'm just he did what he did and he believed what he believed. And so if he had this great debt to Bellarmine, if he had actually read through all these sections, he would, there's nothing that would have prevented him from, from name dropping it, from, from laying it out. So it's one of these things. Um, I traced the genealogy, the genesis of the founding fathers' thought um, with, with, frankly, I think, ineluctable evidence um, in my articles in Catholic Family News, which is titled um, St. Robert Bellarmine, Herald of Republics, question mark. Yeah, I'll, I'll link those below for people who are interested. So yeah, it lays. So I lay out the genesis of the founding fathers. So, well, the, the genesis of the legend itself, how they come up with it. I find areas where uh, uh, Father Morehouse Millar and uh, what's the other guy's name, Christopher Rangers, they make uh, serious errors. They make translation errors of Bellarmine. Rangers very dishonestly misuses Bellarmine's writings in different places to say something that Bellarmine never said. You know, and so because he's so and I don't even think it was a conscious dishonesty in his part, but he's so hoping to get to that, you know, the, the point he wants to make 
that he, he doesn't see anything wrong with, you know, just putting quotes together outside of their actual context to make it say something else than what it actually says. So yeah. all, all of that's in there. And suffice to say, Bellarmine's political philosophy is just very simply, uh, you know, all authority comes from God and it's immediately, you know, through the people irrespective of which type of government you have, whether that's a monarchy or an aristocracy or, or um, you know, democracy or any kind of mixed form of any of those in between. And he wasn't a particularly great political theorist. He didn't mean to be. Suarez really was a far better and more able political theorist, if you're going to get down to it. And he doesn't do anything particularly new, novel. He's really just regurgitating St. Thomas and Aristotle when you yeah. get down to it just for the purpose of refuting Anabaptists and sacramentarians and others who denied the authority of the state. So that, that's really all it is. That's what it boils down to. It's not some mm. great secret that moved men and created our nation. You know, on the other hand, as I say at the end of that article, uh, if you want to make St. Robert Bellarmine the patron of our country, hey, more power to you. I mean, especially mm. a patron that loved the poor so much and, you know, had no love of earthly ambition and possessions. That's yeah, that, I, that's a patron that our country needs.